Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. I've got some cool cases that came in the other day from Retro Flag for your Raspberry Pi. These are called the Super Pi, and they replicate the old Super Famicom and the old Super Nintendo. And you can basically get your little Raspberry Pi loaded up with a uh, retro pie and have a neat little emulator case for them. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure, these came in free of charge from Retro Flag. They just showed up the other day in my mailbox. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review and no one has reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see how these little cases work. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. Uh, these cost $34.99 a piece. And again, I'm very impressed with the overall details and build quality on them. They've got a nice high quality plastic. They don't feel cheap. In fact, it feels really a lot like the uh, SNES or Super Famicom Mini Classic consoles that are out there. Uh, this one might look like it's coming apart just because I haven't screwed it all together. I wanted to very easily uh, get the top popped off of this for you. Now for the $34.99 price, they also pack in a controller, a single controller. Uh, so you get the controller that matches your console here. This is the Super Famicom version, and this one is for the SNES Classic version. And they feel pretty nice. They've got uh, very nice quality plastic. It feels uh, pretty close to what you might get from the SNES Classic Edition, which is what this controller is. I did mod it to be uh, wireless, and we did that in a video the other day. Uh, it feels pretty close. The uh, D-pad feels a little better on the SNES Classic controller. It feels a little stiffer than this one is. It rocks a little better on the SNES Classic, but by and large, it has a nice feel to it, and I think if you are uh, playing some retro games, this is not a bad controller, especially given that uh, you're getting it with the case for that price point. Usually these controllers cost that much on their own, so I think they did okay with these. I'm going to pop the hood on this one so you can see how the Raspberry Pi installs on this, and uh, here you can see how it all comes together. So I've got a Raspberry Pi 3B Plus. This is the newer version with the slightly uh, faster processor on board. And what'll happen is when you put this into the case, a lot of things are just going to line up. So if you look on the back here, uh, this is the HDMI output from the Pi along with its power and its audio lined up perfectly for me. I just had to screw in a few screws here to get it uh, in place and I was off and running. Uh, now what'll happen is if you have the thing put together here, uh, is you will have this little uh, flap here over these two USB ports and the ethernet jack. So if you're not going to be using those, you can just uh, snap this in and conceal them, uh, or you can pop it off and get ethernet and some additional USB going to your device. The other two ports here are used for the front two here. So they kind of run these cables here to map them over to the two ports here on the front. Now, if you're familiar with the Raspberry Pi, you'll know that it doesn't have an on-off switch. When you plug power into it, it just comes on and starts working. Uh, these cases give you a switch that you can use to turn it on and off. So this is what it looks like on the board here. And then, of course, when you have the top part of the case on, uh, you can flip that switch on and off like you would on uh, the Famicom Mini, for example. Now, what'll happen with this is that in, in its default position, it's got this safe shutdown set to off. So you've got a safe shutdown switch here. Uh, when it's on the off position, this is just a dumb on and off switch. So when you flick the switch, it'll turn the Raspberry Pi on. When you turn it off, it kills power to it. Uh, likewise, the reset button here will do the same thing when it's set to uh, not be in its safe shutdown mode. This will just cut power for a second and reboot it. But if you switch the switch on here, uh, what will happen is, is that when you flick that switch to off, for example, it will pass a script to the Raspberry Pi so that it shuts down properly. So when you hit the off button, it won't shut down immediately. It will go through the process of running this script and doing a safe shutdown to turn itself off. And we'll demo that uh, in a minute so you can see how that works. So you'll probably want to take that step to install that script because it will be a lot safer for your Raspberry Pi in the end run, not just to be killing power to it every time. So you do have the option one way or the other, uh, but I would recommend getting the script, turning safe shutdown to on, and operating it that way. Uh, it does this through these uh, connectors here that go onto the GPIO pins of the Raspberry Pi. That's how it sends those commands back and forth, and the script looks for signals that come through on those pins and they have some instructions in the boxes to exactly where to 
uh, put this block of pins on your GPIO segment there. It looks like though it's been pushing my, uh, when I put the case back together, it's pushing them between the pins of the Pi here. So I would have liked a little bit better cable management. It feels a little rough around the edges from that standpoint. But once you get it all together, I think it should work pretty nicely. There's also a header here for a fan. Now I don't think you're going to be able to get a fan on top of the processor, which I know is something a lot of people do, uh, because it looks like they want you to mount the fan here on the bottom of the case and maybe just have the airflow uh, draw the heat away. So this is where the fan exhausts on both of them on the bottom here, as you can see. And I did read some reviews on Amazon where people were complaining that the fans they wanted to use, the ones that directly attached to the board, were not compatible. And the reason is, is that uh, the storage container here for the SD cards is going to make that difficult because that uh, sits very close to the board when it's all put together. So that's why they put the fan output down here. So if you are an overclocker, uh, this may not be the case for you, just given you're going to have a hard time getting a fan directly attached to your processor here. So you might want to poke around a little bit on some of those Amazon reviews and see what uh, people had success or failure with. But it does have a header here for that, uh, so you should be able to get going with those things. But remember that all of the power that the device uses here is getting drawn out of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, so you will have some power limitations if you're running a fan and having all the game controllers plugged in and everything. That will uh, certainly draw out of the Raspberry Pi's power supply. So make sure you've got uh, a decent size USB power adapter attached to your Raspberry Pi or, or you're going to get uh, some of those voltage warnings there. Comes together pretty nicely. You just go ahead and screw everything back together and you are off and running. Uh, the SD card uh, is accessible on the side here so you can very easily uh, get those cards installed and then store them in the case at the top. My only real gripe with this is that there's no easy way to get the cards out short of just kind of tossing the uh, cards out by flipping the console over, but it's still a nice touch to just have a working eject button here on the front. And I think that was what they were going for there. Uh, the SNES case is pretty much the same thing. It's got uh, everything really in the same place as the other one did. Uh, you get a screwdriver in the box with both, by the way, to get everything assembled. So uh, all together, it really is uh, the same experience here, no matter which one you choose. And it's really just a matter of what your personal preferences are. So let's boot this thing up now and get that safe script installed and see how all of that works. Okay, so we've got everything hooked up now, and I'm going to flick on the power switch here on the case, and that will get our Raspberry Pi booted. I did notice that the little red light it has for power went off when I first switched it on, but I suspect that might be because I did enable the safe boot option here in anticipation of installing the script. Now, the script is going to be found on a GitHub page, and I'll put a link to this down below in the video description. And this is the installation process. It's really quite simple here. You just need to make sure that the device is on the internet. You've got a keyboard connected. And what you need to do is hit F4 to drop into the uh, terminal window there, which is what we're going to do now on my keyboard. So I'm just going to switch back here for a second. I'm going to hit F4 on the keyboard. That's going to drop us out into uh, this little menu here, or at least into the command line here. And I'm going to just type in wget minus O, and then uh, the address that they gave us here. I noticed there was a little bit of keyboard mapping issues too. By the way, on here, just by default, I have a US keyboard. When I hit shift and the quotation marks here, I was getting an at symbol. So I had to hit shift and two to get that uh, quotation mark. You might run into that on your own experience if you have a US keyboard like mine. So if you're having that keyboard mapping issue, my suggestion would be to type in exit here and briefly go into the configuration settings of RetroPie and set the keyboard to your regions. We're going to go here to Raspi Config, and I'm going to then have to switch over to my keyboard to finish navigating this menu here. And I'm just going to go over to Localization Options. I'm going to change my keyboard layout, and what'll happen here is it'll pull up what it currently has selected, and that is a 105 key international PC keyboard, but I'm gonna switch over to this generic 101 key just to get that uh, thing working properly. And I'll also uh, select here other uh, and just get it off that UK keyboard and go over to English US keyboard and then uh, go down here and uh, select it once again, it looks like, and hopefully that should be enough to get it going here. And we'll just say the default no compose key and we'll let it be that. So hopefully this will fix our issue here. Let me just back out 
uh, once again. And we'll go back into that terminal screen now and see what happens. You might have to reboot after changing these keyboard commands, and then hopefully all the keys will be in the right place. Okay, so I think we've got everything set up properly now. We've got the command entered. Uh, one thing to note is that there is a little dash here before the uh, URL begins. You might have missed that on the GitHub screens. Make sure you've got that dash O, the dash, the URL that they gave you, uh, the pipe command, which is on my US keyboard, shift and this key here, and then sudo bash, which will basically download this script and execute it. Uh, so we'll hit enter here. And as you can see, now it's doing a bunch of stuff. And hopefully when this is done, after it installs all these different packages, uh, our uh, on-off button will work as we hope it will. Uh, this, by the way, will require a reboot after all these scripts are installed. So you'll have one more reboot the uh, old-fashioned way where you have to shut down and pull the cable and plug it back in. Uh, then after that, everything should be good to go for you. And while this is installing, I thought I would just show you what these scripts do. So if we go up here to uh, the install uh, sh that's running right now, you can see uh, what's happening here is that it's making sure it has all of the right dependencies installed. It's going out and downloading packages that it needs to have the script that will execute the safe shutdown run properly. So it looks like it's doing all of this through Python. And it also has something installed to be looking for uh, those commands being pushed over the GPIO pins from the switch to actually uh, turn it off. And then this is the actual Python script that runs. So you can see here that uh, it's calling on a bunch of modules and whatnot to get all of this working here. Uh, and then it will uh, shut down properly when the button is pushed or uh, switched down into the uh, off position here. So we're going to switch back now. It looks like it did actually reboot itself as part of that script installation. And uh, what I'm going to first try here after it reboots is uh, just pushing down the uh, reset button to see what happens. Now you'll notice now, after that script is installed, our little red light is working here properly. So I'm going to click on uh, reset here, and you can see now it's executed a script, although it looks like it dropped me out into the command line. Oh, there it goes. So it's actually shutting down properly, and it looks like it will restart itself. So that script executed properly there. That was good to see. Um, we'll let this reboot here, and then uh, we'll hit the on-off switch after it comes back up and see if it will properly do that as well. And what's nice about this is that you can actually use the switch on the front of this thing without having to worry about losing any data, uh, because you saw there with the reset button, it actually shut down properly and executed a reboot command, so all the caches got cleared out and everything else. So we're going to now hit the switch here on that, and same thing, it dropped us out to the command line. It should probably execute that shutdown script now, hopefully. And it should hopefully now actually turn itself off completely, which it did. The light went off and it is shut down. And then if we hit the switch again here, it will power back up and reboot. So in many ways, this little thing now is working uh, like a little game console. I can turn it off and turn it back on again. We're not going to kill power right when we hit that switch. It'll execute the script and everything will uh, work just like your SNES Classic can do. But you can control all of it inside of RetroPie. Let's take a look and see how some games run on it now. OK, I don't have many games to show you on this just yet. I haven't installed too many, but I have some Atari and Nintendo games on here. But given the Super Famicom, Super Nintendo thing going, in here with this case, I figured let's uh, load up a Super Nintendo game that I have on the device. We'll do some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time, that will be launching from my device here. And looks like it's loading up and getting us a nice SNES game session going here. And here we go. We can start playing the game and have a great emulation experience with our little Raspberry Pi inside of its little case. So you get the case for pretty much the same price as the computer, $34.99 for the controller of the case, and another $35 for your Raspberry Pi. And you've got yourself a uh, do-it-yourself retro emulation station here. Pretty cool stuff. So I can quit the game here by hitting Select and Start. And then if I'm done playing for a while and need to get back to doing some stuff with the wife and kids, I can shut down the device here. It will turn itself off properly. And we don't have to worry about uh, losing any data in the process. So here we go. It is off. And I think these cases are pretty darn cool. So until next time, this is Lon Sybin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast. Tom Albrecht. Bill Reiner. And Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. 
Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.